Classy guy. Yo. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. This episode is sponsored by Component One, makers of Widgmo. If you need stunning UI elements or awesome graphs and charts, then go to widgmo.com and check them out. Hello, friends. Welcome to JavaScript Jabber. This is episode number 43. Today we have Joe Eames. Howdy. Merrick Christensen. Hey, guys. And Christian Johansson, and also me, Jameson Vance. But Christian is a special guest today. Do you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself for those of us that don't know you? Yeah, yeah sure. So first of all, hi. Uh, so I'm in Oslo, Norway, up in the cold north. Uh, so I, I wrote a book about testing JavaScript uh, a couple of years back called Test Driven JavaScript Development. And I've done a few open source libraries. Uh, perhaps the one that most people know about is signin.js. And currently, I work at Gitorius.org. So that's the brief introduction about me, I guess. Great. Awesome. Um, oh, yeah, Chuck is gone today. He's at CES, I believe. So that's why I'm filling in for him. So I think we want to talk mainly about signin.js today. Do you want to just give an overview of it? Sure. If, so, if you've never heard of signin.js, what is it? So Sun.js is uh, it's a stubbing and mocking library, uh, which means that when you're writing automated tests for, for your JavaScript, uh, Sun.js provides a toolkit to help you test functions and callbacks uh, and stuff like that to track how they're being used throughout the system. And then it also provides some utilities to test asynchronous stuff through timers, like set timeout and set interval and those kind of things. And it also has a fake... XML HTTP request implementation. So it allows you to test your client-side JavaScript completely decoupled from the server, and it gives you an API to mimic the role of the server in your tests. So you can focus a test on how the uh, client-side reacts to various kind of behavior from the server. So you talked about stubbing and mocking, and I think that means we have to get into the hairy discussion of the difference between stubs and mocks. Mm -hmm. And spies. And spies, yeah. So do you want to explain that a little bit? Sure. I can explain my take on it, because <laughs> I know there are uh, more than just mine. Sure. Um, so I, I, I'm using the terminology pretty much like Martin Fowler did. And he's, uh, he has a famous article called Spice or Not Mocks or something like that. So the basic principle implemented in Sinon is that a spy is a function that just records information about how it's being used. So if you call it, it sets a flag called, and it counts how many times it's been called, what kind of arguments you pass into it, and so on. And basically, that's all it does. And then a stub builds upon that concept by allowing you to also control what it does. So you can create a stub, and then you get a function object that will record everything just like a spy. And then you can tell it to return certain values, or if if it receives these arguments, then throw an exception, and so on. And then a mock builds upon that again, where you can also build in expectations. So you could tell the mock that, so if you call more than two times, throw an exception immediately. That's uh, the the rough cut of it, I think. That's interesting. I I guess I misunderstood what stubs were. I thought stubs were just basic dumb things that you don't. You just specify like a dummy return value for a function or a dummy value for an object or something. Is there a technical name for that, where you just no, say you need to you need to pass in some dependency and you just always want it to return like eleven? What do, what do you call that? I call that a stub. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So so you can that's what I typically use the sign in stubs for, but they also take on this. So they give you more guy. than that. Yeah, so you can also ask them afterwards, like, will you call more than three times or, or whatever, because they just inherit the spy interface. Sure. Was there other mocking libraries that you used um, as kind of a starting point and a reference point for when you created SignOn, or did you just, like, forge off into the wilderness? Uh, not really, because uh, at some point I thought... Uh, hey, should I write a stubbing on mocking library? And I thought, no, we probably already have ton tons of those, so I'm not going to do that. 
then I started looking around, and there really wasn't any alternatives for JavaScript uh, that were any good at the at the time. So, as I was writing the book, I got kind of tired of repeating the same manual stubs all over all over the place. Um, I was writing stubs and spice like manually, just the way they are in Sinon, and it just started like I extracted the basic stub creating function into a a file that I started sharing around, and then I figured maybe we should make a library out of this. So uh, apart from that, I've been using uh, Mocha in in Ruby. So I guess it was kind of inspired in part by that, but uh, it's really a different kind of API, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what um, what background did you have in history? Did you have with um, testing, unit testing, and mocking this when you? Kind of embarked on this process. Just I've been, yeah, mostly Ruby, but I've also done a lot of testing with JavaScript. So, for stubs and stuff like that in JavaScript, I just always did that by hand because functions are easy to create with JavaScript, right? So, I don't know. I I've been testing JavaScript and Ruby for quite a few years before I started writing the library. I guess I started working on signing in. 2010, maybe late 2009. So, th yeah, the experience is just working on various apps and writing tests for them with various kinds of uh, test frameworks throughout the years. So you don't have any uh, experience with a mocking library from a strictly typed language, like Java mm -hmm. or something like that? No, actually not. I I've written tests for Java, but I never use any of the mocking frameworks. Interesting. Yeah, there's just this huge disparity between mocking and strictly typed languages and mocking and uh, these loosely typed languages. And I'm not what do you mean disparity? Like that people don't do it as much or in the tools? Just the, the, in the tools. Uh, they, obviously, they do it a lot more in strictly typed languages than they do in, uh, well, I don't know, Ruby is pretty heavily tested, right? But JavaScript is like, meeting, meeting somebody who tests JavaScript is like finding a unicorn. Well, I think, I think, too, with the, with the strictly typed languages, mocking frameworks have it a little bit easier because they, they just need to honor an interface, right? Yeah. Would you Whereas agree? in JavaScript, you kind of have to, like, what, for in, I mean, for in the properties and, and replace them accordingly, or the ones that are explicitly asked to stub? Right. Right. Is, is uh, mocking in JavaScript pretty much like mocking in uh, Ruby? I guess so, uh, in some ways. Actually, I think there's a difference because uh, in in JavaScript, you have proper first-order functions, right? In, in Ruby, you typically always have classes and objects. So I think it's a little bit more involved to do uh, mocking, at least for one-on-one -on -one function in Ruby. So yeah. sign-in sign -in only focuses on functions. So if you want to stub and hold a whole object, there's a couple of tools for that. But really, it encourages you to just make an object literal and define spice for the functions that is needed for the current test. Yeah, using, would you say sign on.spy for that, the particular yeah, values? Yeah. It depends on what you're using it for. If you needed any other functions to call a callback or return a value, then you'll use a spy. If you don't need it to do anything, you use a, oh, sorry, use a stub. And if you don't need it to do anything, then you use spy. OK, cool. So I have a question on just mocking and, and this style of testing in general. I haven't done a ton of it. I've kind of dabbled in it. And the, the, the little bit that I've done, it feels like I spend a lot of time re-implementing the code that I'm trying to test to make sure that everything's all stubbed out correctly. Does that mean I'm doing it wrong? Is that just like a, a hump I have to get over? Or do you have any suggestions to, to avoid that feeling? Uh, it probably means that something's not uh, the way it should be. Typically, I the way I use uh, spice and stubs is mostly to test uh, the communication between objects or functions or whatever. So you're not really supposed to re-implement the logic. In some cases, I would think that you, you'll end up re-implementing logic if your test is too big, if you're trying to achieve too many things in a test. And the solution to that is to build smaller tests. 
focus on just one behavior at a time and then use a really simple stub that forces your code through that path. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So t typically, like, if you have a, 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 some API that takes in a, a callback of some sort, then you can set up one test that says, what happens if this callback returns the number 42? And the next test can be, what happens if this function throws an error? But you have to split them up like that, because if you don't, then you will end up, like you said, re-implementing logic within your tests. Sure. And then you're not really testing anything. You just have a really <laughs> elaborate way of doing the same code twice and no way of knowing if it really works. Sure. So um, I'm kind of curious about the history of SignOnJS. Once you published it, have you made a lot of uh, changes and enhancements to it based on community feedback? Or did you feel like, did you end up kind of really getting it right right from the beginning? I think I ended up getting it right enough. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, I I released a, like a pre-release version as I was writing the book because I, I wrote the library at the same time I wrote the book. And then I decided that uh, before this book uh, is on sale, I have to get this thing into 1.0. And I want it to be stable because the API is briefly presented in the book and I wanted it to not break. Like if you pick up the book, then the first week I would want the library to still work. So I spent a lot of time thinking about the design before I handed off the manuscript to the book. So I was uh, kind of sure that I had what I wanted. And then I called it 1.0 right before the book came out. And now we're at 1.5. And there's been no breaking changes since 1.0. At least wow. no intentional breakages. Hooray, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> wow. semantic versioning. <laughs> yeah, right. Semantic versioning for the win. And uh, but there's been some uh, additions after that, uh, but mostly I've been pretty happy with it for a long time. So other people have added more to it during the last year than I did. Hmm. I was just gonna say it's cool to have you know that kind of good community involvement. Yeah, definitely. So, I'm very happy about that. I wanted to ask about the fake XHR thing. Um, do you just override the Windows XHR like property and just give it something that has a compatible interface interface that you can listen on, or how does that work? Yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, I implemented the XML HTTP request spec uh, in JavaScript, and then there's a function uh, that takes over the global uh, XML HTTP HTTP request object, but that's not enough because it also has to work in IE. So in oh, IE, no. <laughs> in IE, you typically have to uh, also override ActiveX object, and it has a really weird API because you say ActiveX object and then you pass in a string to specify what uh, API you're using. So that means that I have to override ActiveX object and only override it if the argument is, I don't know, XML, HTTP, or any of the other IDs that signify sure. XHR. So it's it's a little bit messy, uh, <laughs> but it works. It works for the most part. It's just a cool idea. Yeah. So oh, that's brilliant. Since you're talking already about uh, mocking XHR, let's talk about mocking the uh, clock. Yeah. Sure. So, so that's an idea that I actually stole from someone else. It was implemented in JS Unit, which is, as far as I know, the first ever JavaScript testing framework. I don't know when they got it, but I discovered it by chance at some point. And I thought, this is a cool idea. I've, I want to steal this. Uh, and my initial attempt was to bar their implementation, but I don't really remember why, but it wasn't really portable. So I ended up writing it over again. Uh, but that, it's the same principle. So I, I defined four functions, uh, set timeout, set in interval, and declare timeout, declare interval. And then I have a function to copy those four functions into the global uh, namespace and revert them again if you need to restore the actual timers. And that's actually the hardest part. So for that to work properly in IE, you have to load two files because it's really, really hard to make set timeout uh, writable while still keeping a reference to the original function. Huh. Why is that? Do you know? 
if if I'd known, uh, I would have gladly explained, but I, I'm not really sure. It's so in IE uh, set timeout is uh, ha has not is not writable by default. So you you cannot say uh, window dot set timeout equals something else, but you can make a function declaration called set timeout that will make it writable, but that will also lose the original uh, ref reference to the function. And because the function declaration is hoisted, you lose it for good. So that's why we're using two files to get that to work. Oh, wow. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, it's messy. That's crafty, though. <laughs> so one of the things that I thought was coolest about mocking the clock was the ability to do it when dealing with data objects. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's... Um, same thing again, we're uh, overriding the data object, and when you initialize the fake timers, you use, uh, initialize it with uh, a starting time, which defaults to just zero. And when you say clock that tick uh, 1500, then it will call any callback schedule with set time up within the next 1500 milliseconds, but then it will also update uh, whatever date uh, dot now is. So if you create date objects, they will have the time corresponding to how much you tick the clock manually. Oh, that's really cool. So if, if, you, if you create a date and then you tick the clock 1,500 milliseconds uh, forward and then create a new date object, they will be 1,500 milliseconds apart. Wow. I haven't actually uh, taken advantage of that, but I imagine that you found that to be really valuable. Yeah. Uh, I, I used it uh, originally for one of the sample, ch um, the code examples in the book where I'm implementing like a long polling Ajax thing to do a chat application and uh, in the long polling implementation the dates were kind of important for figuring out when to when to fire the next request and so on and they also used date objects uh, to kill requests after a certain amount of time and yeah so, so then I needed the date objects to behave properly Sure. Cool. So since you mentioned the book again, can we talk a little bit about the book? I'd like to hear about, you know, why you wrote it and the process of writing it and, um, you know, what you learned from it, what, what interesting things you discovered about it. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> the why is actually the publisher contacted me, asked if I wanted to write a book. I, I guess I, was, uh, I blogged a lot at the time. And then the, the publisher stumbled upon my blog, asked if I wanted to write a book, and I thought, yeah, I do. <laughs> and so I set aside some time and uh, started writing. And I knew it was going to be about testing because that was what I'd been writing about for like a year in advance. Anyway, so it's, it's a topic that I've been very interested in. And uh, the process, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And I, I learned a lot about what the book is about because when you're writing about these things, you have to really do a deep dive to make sure you have every base covered, that you present things properly, everything's correct. I went over the uh, ECMAScript spec several times while, while writing it to make sure that everything was technically correct. And it's really felt like a bit of a research project, even if... I, the book is not very scientific or anything, but for me it was like uh, felt like doing a lot of research and then sitting down, writing down some things, more research, uh, editing, and then uh, having an argument with my technical reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> Did and you then, win by saying, "Hey, I'm the expert. I wrote the book"? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but I had some excellent technical uh, reviewers. Uh, among them, uh, I had uh, uh, Andrea Giamarchi. You may know him as uh, Web Reflection uh, on Twitter and other places. And he's, uh, he's a man of strong opinions. And he's also, uh, <laughs> he's also very, very smart. Uh, but we have some differences uh, in how we prefer certain things. We had some uh, interesting arguments uh, while, w while I was working on the book. But oh. I learned a lot from it, and it was really fun working with him. Awesome. So, how long have you um, been doing test-driven development? Uh, I'd say maybe uh, six years, something like that. 
Uh, what year are we now? Oh, maybe seven? Yeah, what, six, what seven you, years. What caused you to get into it? I would have to say probably Rails, <laughs> I think. Because hmm. awesome. uh, I, I did some testing prior to that, but I think the... I think Rails was really pushed me into it, the way that I'm doing it now, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. So what uh what industry luminaries um, do you take inspiration from when in specifically relating to tester and development? Well, obviously Kent Beck. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I learned a lot from him. Like the after after Rails kind of got me started. Uh, I immediately plunged into a lot of Kent Beck's material that I'd been looking at briefly before, but then I studied it uh, over, and I learned a lot from him. And also, he he's done some videos for Pragmatic, uh, what was it called, Pragmatic Bookshelf, or yeah, whatever, those guys. He, he did some videos. If you haven't seen them, you really should, because they're really interesting to watch him. Just get to watch him work. And, and that was just on got, the, what? Sorry, that was on the Pragmatic, book, the pragmatic Programmers? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He did a series of videos for them, and you get to just watch him sit there and code and think out loud. And he has a really interesting way of thinking about and approaching problems. So I, I, I learned a lot from him and from uh, like Bob Martin and uh, uh, Bob, Uncle Uncle Bob Martin. Uncle Bob, I mentioned him, but uh, also uh, Michael Feathers. Michael Feathers. Ah. Yeah. So like the the good old guys <laughs> that the uh, kickstarted the whole. Yeah, extreme programming thing. Yeah. Sure. So what do you most frequently, I mean, you're, you're obviously using Synem. I'm wondering what uh, test framework you typically use it with. I'm actually also writing my own test framework. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Any, any plans for releasing it? Yeah, so it's called Buster.js, and I'm doing it with a friend oh, of mine. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I've, I've used Buster, actually. Yeah, okay. Right. So... Um, we started this actually over two years ago, and we had a lot of plans for it. It was still due, but uh, it's taking a lot more time than we'd planned to get it uh, stable enough. And um, but I, I'm using it for the stuff that we do at work, and I have been for quite a while. Right. Um, before that, I used JS Test Driver, which works by the same model. Um, it allows you to automate tests from the console through browsers, through a server. So you can hook up uh, browsers uh, as slaves uh, to a server, and then you can issue test runs from the command line. Yeah, so you, get you get results from actual browsers, but in the console. Buster also seems to be uh, one of the few that wants to be kind of a, a full solution. Uh, I mean, they, they have node connectors, AMD, even, AMD yeah. plugin, et cetera. Yeah, like the, so. The uh, original idea was that there are tons of tons of uh, half-baked test frameworks for JavaScript stuff that people did through one weekend or whatever. So we wanted to provide, like, if you will, like the enterprise version or <laughs> something that's sure. more complete. Sure. Um, yeah. That's very much the feeling I got when I was using Buster. So, are there any other test frameworks that you've used that you uh, like? and thought were, you know, pretty cool? I haven't really used that many of them. I've never used Jasmine, uh, which is a tool that I know a lot of people like. I used JS Test Driver, and, and, and then I used the prototype testing framework for, for some time, but I don't think I'd recommend that to anyone now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not that it's bad. It, it was good for its time, but, you know, there are better solutions now. So... I don't know. I haven't really tested them all a lot. I used YOI test for a little while as well. It's a bit, I don't know, it's it's not for me, but sure. it's good stuff, I guess. So in terms of sign-in, uh, it seems like that is one area where there's not really any other options. Like, people haven't felt a lot of need. Do you know of any sort of, uh, I don't want to say competitors, but other mocking and stopping libraries? Because there's only like is such a such yeah. It's a funny. There's a thousand test frameworks and there's one mocking framework. That's true. Yeah, and they all recommend Simon. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because uh, that was kind of what I was hoping for when I started. Like I've, I very 
worked very hard to make it a test framework agnostic, so it should be easy to integrate into test frameworks. And I was kind of, <laughs> I was kind of hoping to, I was hoping that Sino would be like the engine for other people's stubbing uh, solutions, and that has happened to a certain degree. So I know that the test framework that ships with Kooks do, uh, the UI framework, they have a stub and mock API, which is actually powered by Sinon. So that's oh. really cool. That's the kind of thing that I was hoping that it would be used for. And I know that uh, Jasmine has their own thing built in, but some people still seem to prefer Sinon. I haven't used theirs, so, so I wouldn't really know. But then the, the, the only other one I really know about is something called Mock Jax. I don't have a lot to say about it because I don't know know it very well, but uh, that's one alternative, I guess. I think that it's more geared towards mocking objects, whereas Sina is very focused on functions. Yeah, and it supports objects as well, in a sense. I mean, objects are just collections of functions, so, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think that Sinon. Uh, does anything to keep you from working with objects? It's just that I don't think I don't think it's necessary to have a lot of tools geared towards objects because it's so easy to just make an object literal and stick spice in it. Yeah. So in a strictly typed language, the mocking frameworks usually have a fairly um, significant um, piece that is for mocking properties and not just the methods, whereas uh, Sinon doesn't mock properties at all. Do you have any plans to take advantage of the is it BS five um, property uh, getter setter stuff and provide mocking or stubbing with that? It's fine. I want to say no. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, there's no support for getters or setters at this point, and to be honest, I'm not really that much of a fan. So uh, I'd prefer to not do anything with that for the moment. If someone comes along with a reasonable implementation, I'll look at it, but uh, I don't know. I'm really on the fence with getters and setters. I'm not a huge fan. Gotcha. One of the other things that I was uh, I thought was really cool about Sinon is the matchers. And I know that that's um, a really distinct feature. Uh, I don't think uh, Jasmine has any concept of, of matchers. Could you uh, explain a little bit like what matchers are and how you came up, why you came up with them, the value of them? Uh, first of all, I want to say that I didn't come up with them at all. So uh, the matchers is uh, one of the f several features delivered by a guy called Maximilian Anthony from Switzerland. Uh, he's a great guy. And he um, he's the only other person than me that now has commit access to the main signer repository. Um, so he's, he's done several things with Sinon, and that's I think is biggest addition to the library, and it's it's somewhat similar to a concept that we have in the assertions we ship with Buster, that allows you to match objects uh, loosely by various criteria. So for sign-in, that means that you can check that a function was called with some arguments, but you can also enforce some loose constraints. Like I want it to be called with a string and a function, but you don't have to say the exact string. And also with functions, it's really hard to to match it unless you can get access to the exact function that was passed in. So it's just a way of testing uh, the kinds of things that are being passed around without having to specify exactly what they are. Right. And there's also a, a matcher in there that allows you to partially compare objects. Like I, I wanted this object to have these three properties, and I don't really care if they have other properties as well. Oh, okay. I'm looking at the example here. That's what this first one is, where you're calling the sign dot match and passing in an object that has an author property. So you're just saying, I don't care what it's called with as long as it's some object that has these properties. That's correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah, and you can be vague, right? It, it, you can say that it just has to have these properties, but you don't care what the property values are, or you can actually specify that the properties have to have these values as well, right? Yeah. So, like one of the places that I've been bitten a bunch before is, verif you know, verifying a call that came in with a callback, and I had access to the callback, but I was actually end up wrapping that callback in like uh, jQuery's proxy to make sure that it was bound correctly to the right context, 
And since that was happening somewhere else, I couldn't get access to the proxied function, function only the interior function. So having the ability to match it just by, hey, it's just got to be a function is just, you know, absolutely huge for me. Yeah. Uh, you could do it before, too, because you always have access to the, uh, to the arguments. So you could do a type of check, but it's really kind of verbose and ugly. Uh, so I really like the matchers because they allow you to be a little bit more descriptive about you trying what you're trying to achieve. Uh, yeah, it, it it reads a lot better, I think. I've got to say the the docs are really good. It's a credit to you guys that I feel like almost everything we've asked about we could have just like read in the docs. It's still great <laughs> to have you on here, but uh, they're they're very complete and clear, and that's a big change from some other JavaScript projects, I think. Sometimes they don't get documented that well, so they're great. No, yeah, so, thanks. So something that's probably not in the docs. Uh, what did you find to be like the hardest uh, things to figure out when you were building sign on? I think that the stuff that I mentioned uh, with overriding uh, set timeout and the other globals, uh, while still being able to restore them. Uh, so basically, been... IE. Yeah. <laughs> in short, IE. Yeah. Because that uh, it's it's nowhere near as difficult in the other browsers, so that's definitely been the toughest part to make that right. Hmm. And also, I feel that uh, so over the past year or so, uh, when I have a lot of uh, contributions from other people, it's been other kinds of challenges to like keep up and to I don't know review stuff properly. Uh, we had a couple of or I did one release that I where I accidentally broke something. That was kind of a reminder that, hey, <laughs> you need to pay attention when you're not writing the code yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> that's been a bit of a new situation. Um, but it's definitely manageable. So one of the things that I think you implied early on in the podcast was if, if you're testing a, an object, let's say that that object has two methods, method A and method B, and method A internally calls method B, how do you feel about uh, stubbing out method B just when you're testing method A so that you're not actually testing method B as well? Are you for that or against that? Do you have any reasons why? I think I'd have to say that I'm in principle against that because I usually never stub out ob uh, methods on the object that I'm testing. And the reason for that is that if, if you have a method A that's calling a method B on the same object, and you're stubbing out method B, then really the test is very implementation specific. So it's it, it, the fact that it's calling another function on the same object is really an implementation detail. It, it's not part of its public API. So I'd say that uh, in a situation like that, if you have a need to do that, maybe that's a, a signal that your design can be improved somehow. Cool. I like that answer. Definitely some, one of the things that's been on my, my mind a lot. How would you say is the state of test-driven development in JavaScript today? I think it's picking up. It's probably still not uh, as great as in, like, I think that in the Ruby community there's been a lot of focus on testing. I guess that the, with Node projects it's probably picked up a bit of speed. But I still think that most jQuery plugins and code that people use a lot uh, is still, by large, untested. But I'm not really, I haven't measured this recently. This is just my gut feeling. And this is how it's looked every time I've looked. There's a lot of test frameworks. <laughs> There's a lot more <laughs> test frameworks than, uh, than there seem to be people using them. Uh, <laughs> So the people, they write a test framework and then they don't test anymore. They're like, my job here is done. Yeah. yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how they decide if they want to test. <laughs> and um, inter interestingly, there's also a lot of test frameworks that don't have tests. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> but I actually uh, teach a course here uh, in Norway. Uh, it's a bi-monthly thing, three days. I teach people to do TDD with uh, JavaScript. And uh, so, and there's there's a good amount of people showing up for those courses. I think the interest is there, but people are not finding the time at their day job. I think to get into it because it does take a little bit of time to get comfortable with it, get it into your workflow, 
So I think people are, you know, scooching it off. It's like any new skill, right? When you first try it, you're going to be slower at it. So I think to some people, they just keep putting it off because it's not worth it at that time to do yeah. lots of testing because it'll make them slower for X amount of days or weeks or whatever to get stuff done now. But <laughs> uh, hopefully it pays off in the end. I, I think another problem is you mentioned Node. And in my experience, it's been a lot easier to test stuff written in Node um, than, than things that interact heavily with the browser and with users. And part of that is just tooling. Like, I've just spent a couple days getting our, our one of our big front-end apps testable just with unit tests and the integration tests, and it's a giant pain in the butt. And if I didn't have time dedicated to, like, set aside to do it, then I would never have done it. So I, I don't know. I hope that situation gets better, too. Yeah, I think with Node, too, like, your script loaders are not asynchronous. So that's, like, one of the biggest things that's been easy for me in terms of testing Node is that when I require a, a module, I have it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas that's not necessarily the case uh, in, in browsers. No, but I think yeah. that's more of an inconvenience than anything else. It shouldn't really stop you from testing. Agreed. Yeah, uh, that's all and also, uh, in terms of uh, testing browser code, I definitely agree that coming back to test browser code after the fact is really, really, really hard, which is why I think that TDD is such a good fit for JavaScript uh, in the browser, because if you're writing tests as you go, then your designs will be completely different. You will automatically have to design your code to avoid browser APIs all the time, right? And I, th I think that the traditional jQuery, like, cowboy mess <laughs> uh, needs to die if you want to make testable code. It doesn't really work out to just do jQuery function and then blah, throw up lots of code. <laughs> it doesn't really take you that far. So if you want to make it testable, you have to make it module. Uh, um, you have to modularize your code so it's possible to, you know, see some kind of API that you can call from your tests. And that's where I think the biggest problem is today is that people just don't apply abstractions to JavaScript at all. Like, they just throw stuff together. You know, an event handler here, some Ajax stuff, boom, 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 here's my site. Let me just store all this state in the DOM. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's use data attributes and store yes. lots of state in there. Oh, my gosh. So when you're testing... Um, in the browser, uh, your strategies for testing with code that might interact with the DOM, is that to um, isolate the DOM code into some other classes and only and have your logic in a class by itself, or do you um, support DOM testing? Do you, do you actually, phys actually test the methods that are interacting with the DOM? Yeah, sure. Um, so I do both things, I think. I, I try to keep the DOM or the browser-specific parts uh, contained to one area of the code and then have as much as possible uh, or as much of the code base as possible free from browser APIs. And that's actually kind of easy if you have that thought in your head as you're writing the code. And then I also test the browser parts but I try to at least make them uh, so that they only work in memory. So, you, like, if you have some kind of widget that you pass in the root node, and then it only works on the root node, because then you can construct in-memory DOM elements, pass them in, and make sure that they've been manipulated the way you want, as opposed to having the module use CSS selectors to reach for stuff globally in the document and then merging that. Uh, did that make any sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. I think, I think testing some of these MVC frameworks, like a uh, backbone, lends itself really naturally to that because it creates the element in memory first. So your rendering kind of sets up your DOM ahead of time. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, I guess we need to wrap this up, right, Jason? Yep. Yeah, we're about at the time. So if you guys have any last things you want to say or ask, go for it. Uh, I just want to pipe in that I think that. Sign on is possibly the biggest contribution to uh, testing JavaScript that's been done uh, in the industry. So I personally, I just want to thank you because I think that's pretty awesome. I was totally jones to have you on here. No, oh, thanks a lot. It's uh, very nice to hear. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that sec sentiment. Uh, I've played around with a lot of testing frameworks, but Cyanin is the one tool that's kind of followed me between them. Oh, glad All to right. hear it. Yeah. All right, let's go to the picks. Um, Joe, do you want to start us off? You bet. All right, so my first pick is going to be the movie Jack Reacher. I went and saw this last weekend, and uh, they did a really good job. I, I understand that from, like, the book or something, Jack Reacher's supposed to be, like, this huge six-foot-eight guy, so Tom yeah. Cruise, a funny yeah. cast for that. But I really think they must have done a really good job of casting other really short actors. Because they gave them tall shoes or something? Maybe. <laughs> I, think, I think the movie was awesome. I loved it. Great guy movie, good action, but also a really interesting kind of plot and mystery going on. And also, my other pick is going to be uh, the game Torchlight 2. I picked that up on Steam sale over this the holiday weekend, and I've been playing that quite a bit. It's a lot like Diablo, a little bit more cartoony, but I think the implementation is even a little superior to Diablo's. I really like it. So that's going to be my second pitch pick is uh, Torchlight 2. Jack Reacher, it feels a little bit like Man Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this throwaway, like hilariously over-the-top action stuff. It's, it's good stuff. Merrick, do you want to go? That, that sounded like an insult to me. But, uh... Well, I mean... <laughs> Twilight is great if you like it. Jack Reacher. I've read lots of his books, and they're not great literature, but they're really entertaining reads. Really? Anyways, Merrick, do you want to go? Sure. So the first thing is the effective JavaScript book by Dave Herman. I just finished reading that last night, and it is probably the most enlightening JavaScript book that I've read to date. Second would be RDO. It's just a... Uh, I love being able to stream all my music. It's incredible. Sweet. I'll go next. So I have three picks. The first one is like five years too late because I guess it's been going on for a while. But it's just the TV show Adventure Time. Um, I've heard a lot about it, but I just never sat down and watched any of it. It's this kid's cartoon. It's kind of like SpongeBob if it wasn't really annoying. Like it just follows these <laughs> adventures of these two awesome bros. And, and I don't know. It's It's really great at being like friendly, happy humor, but still has stuff that's funny to adults. So Adventure Time is awesome. Awesome. Um, my next pick, it's called uh, How to Implement a Paper. And it's just this blog post about implementing some algorithms you find in, in reading papers. They usually don't give great pseudocode or, or code at all for their algorithm. They just kind of talk about it and use lots of math. And it can be a little tricky to read the paper and figure out how you actually translate their ideas into code. So this is a good read about how to do that. And then my last pick is this blog post about Vim. I use Vim. It's amazing, and there's always more stuff to learn. And it's just talking about cool stuff you can do with Vim registers. Um, and I learned a, a few things I'd never heard of. So it's called Advanced Vim Registers. And the, the links to all this stuff will be in the show notes. So, All right. Christian, you want to give us your picks? Yeah, sure. So my first pick is going to be a site that a friend of mine does. So you mentioned Vim. Uh, so we're Emacs users here in the civilized part of the world. Oh, no. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might accidentally delete your voice. In the yeah. <laughs> so uh, so um, my friend uh, Mangnar uh, does a uh, site called emacsrocks.com, and no matter if you use Emacs or not, you should watch his videos. It is like uh, three to five minute videos showing off some crazy stuff you can do in Emacs, and he has this really... This is a really great way of presenting it. It's just f good fun to watch. And there's also a blog there where he walks you through his uh, Emacs setup in just really short blog posts. So that's great. That's my first, first pick. And my second one is a talk. It's a bit old, but maybe not everyone has seen it yet, uh, by Rich Hickey, who uh, is the author of Clojure, the, the language. It's called Simple Made Easy, and it's a presentation that every programmer should see. It's uh, completely awesome. It talks about uh, it talks about simplicity and uh, yeah, and and how that does not necessarily mean easy. And yeah, it's just a good talk. You you should watch it. And my final pick is Lego Lord of the Rings, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> which is yeah, awesome. It's Lego guys and I reenacting the Lord of the Rings movies. 
Uh, and it's just great fun. So I play it on the Xbox. We have we bought that game, and it's in the shrink wrap on my mantle, waiting for my son to be good at school enough days in a row that we can unwrap it and play it. Yeah, <laughs> you have something to look forward to. It's uh, it's great, great fun. Tonight could be the night. If he's good at school today, then it's that's it. I'm going to be playing that tonight. Yeah, well, maybe if you're good at work, you can open it early or something. Yeah, no, that's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, Christian, it was it was great to have you on here. Um, I'm really glad we got to talk about sign on. I've used it a little bit, but I'll definitely use it more after hearing about it. So this is cool. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Next week we are doing our book club episode. Um, we're going to be talking about effective JavaScript, the the book that pretty much everyone has picked at one point or another for the last few weeks. And we're going to have David Herman, the author, on. So uh, read the book, and we'll talk about it, and it'll be awesome. Uh, I have one more uh, pick to throw in at the end, uh, since you were you reminded me of something. Uh, my Plural Site course on testing JavaScript is going to be coming out in the next month, and there's a pretty big module on sign-on on there, so that should be available around the beginning of February. Yeah, right, cool. Sweet. All right, anything else? Okay. No, nope, that's it. All right, see you guys. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Christian. See you next, Christian. Bye.